What do you want? That's a long conversation, but you have a little suspense. Oh, yeah. And, um, there's another one on Netflix series. Yeah. Maybe not even the acting was amazing. It was dark. I highly recommend it. Yeah. 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 I'm half of a forgot. And then one of them showed up on the long list. And I was like, and then it's like, I'm going to do it. it's like non-stop. Wow. You have like the summer and then the school year. Yeah. I'm really good at it. No, it's a matter of the time. What about you? Nice. I was like, I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I mean, if I'm the I mean, I mean, I'm the 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 Are you watching it? <laughs> Undergraduate Research Society. Uh, I'm the president of the Undergraduate Research Society. 
And I'm so excited uh, for you to be here in person or virtually this season. It's going to be great. Um, our MCs for tonight will be um, Catherine Beck and Boye Dong. Um, Boye is our treasurer and a third year professional student in the Free Pharmacy Program. Um, and Catherine is a college of science lady. Um, and she's a senior in, the, in their lab. Tonight, 10 undergraduate researchers from disciplines all across campus will present their three-minute research pitch. An initial panel of judges competitively selected these top 10 presenters. In between each presenter, we will have a short break to allow the judges time to score each presenter. If you need to leave the room at any point during the evening, we try to exit and enter during these breaks to avoid any interruptions. After the presentations, the in-person audience will vote for the audience favorite. The first place winner will receive a $300 award, the second place winner a $200 award, and the third place winner a $100 award. The audience favorite will also receive a $100 award. The Purdue Office of Undergraduate Research will distribute the awards to the student account after the event. The audience favorite gets two honorable mentions will also receive gifts from our sponsors, Fuhat, GQT Theaters, Mary Lou Donuts, and Vienna Espresso Bar and Bakery. We have three outstanding judges tonight who graciously <coughs> give their time and talent to provide feedback into the hard part of selecting our top awardees. Here we have Ms. Karen Vincent Ward, Senior Operations Manager for the Institute for a Sustainable Future, Dr. Bethany McAllen, Associate Professor of Purdue Library and School of Information Studies and Fulbright Scholar, and Dr. Brandon Strohmeyer. PharmD and PhD candidate in medicinal chemistry and molecular pharmacology. Again, thank you so much for coming to tonight's event, and now I would like to introduce our first presenter of the night. Thank you, <laughs> First up, we have Kasha Akinapoli, of software and biomedical engineer with his project examining the implications of delta like one intracellular domain overexpression on muscle stem cell differentiation. Please welcome him to the stage. Hey folks, imagine an athlete who has ran many races and has won many gold medals over the period of his lifetime and now he's competing at the Olympics. Once he starts competing in his track and field race, he starts to feel a searing pain in his hamstrings. And only soon after does he realize that he has just torn his hamstring. This is not only the case for many athletes, but also people who have muscle dystrophy or the elderly who face muscle degeneration. But what if I told you that there was a cell mechanism that is only one, there is only one cell mechanism that is a solution away for helping people live a better life. I'm gonna introduce you guys today to DLL1 or Delta like ligand one, which is believed to have an autonomous signaling function that is independent of not signaling. Specifically, I'll be talking about DLL1's intracellular domain, or DLL1 ICD. I began my research by first doing endless literature reviews. I practically became acquainted with biochemistry and molecular biology. And I soon found out that a lot of research articles focused on DLL1, as I'm showing in the mechanism over here but there's very little focus on DLL1's ICD. So I got a bit curious and I designed a study that focused on the overexpression of DLL1's ICD on muscle stem cell differentiation. So 
the way I began this study was by finding out how I can express DLL1 psi CD. And I did this by having an engineered plasmid which contains a mic tag to recognize the location of DLL1 psi CD and a doxycycline induced system, which I'll talk about later. I then have a biological triplet, as seen over here. And I split it among a dox negative, which is a group of cells that do not receive doxycycline and the dox positive cells which receive doxycycline and i first added the media and then i i added the media i added the media i added the cells into the plate cultured them added the doxycycline to only the doxycycline cell plate and what I soon found out was that there was a protein, well, not a protein, but DLL1's ICD was able to have an effect on impeding muscle differentiation. And thank you. Next, we have Aditya Arjun Kanipa, a junior in aeronautical and astronautical engineering with this project, Autonomous Asteroid Navigation via Optical Images. Please welcome him to the stage. All right, let's get started. Imagine yourself millions of miles away from Earth, trying to navigate an asteroid that you know almost nothing about. How would you do that? Well, Today, most of the space missions to asteroids are to asteroids that we already know a lot about because we've been observing them for years from the ground. But we don't have that luxury with any and every asteroid in space. Well, that's the problem my research is trying to solve. Let's start with the basics. How does a spacecraft move around a small body like an asteroid? Well, interestingly, it isn't just about the gravity. You need to consider the pressure from the sun's solar radiation because an asteroid's gravity is so weak that it can actually push and perturb your asteroid's gravity, uh, your spacecraft's gravity uh, trajectory enough that it might fall out of orbit, as you can see in those simulations in the top left. Now, to characterize this, I use something called the augmented normalized field free body problem as my dynamics model. Now, this is a simplification because it's useful for spacecraft computers, simple enough for that, but it doesn't consider an asteroid's irregular shape and gravity. So we need another source of information. This is where the optical images come in. So what I've done is I've modeled uh, synthetic images of spheres, ellipsoids, and asteroid 3D meshes as though they were in space and illuminated by the sun. Once you have these images at varying distances and angles, you calculate the pixel coordinates of the lit horizon using edge detection. 
And with that information, you put it, feed that data into something called an optical navigation algorithm. What this does is takes those pixel coordinates and some initial guess of your asteroid shape ratios. It might be inaccurate, but close enough. And then calculates your spacecraft's relative position to the asteroid. Now, as you can see in the bottom left, it's fairly accurate in terms of following the trajectory, but there's still some noise at more irregular uh, points. So what you do is you combine both of these sets of data. You take the OPNAV and you take the dynamics, and then you bring those together in something called an EKF, a filter, to come with the best estimates possible. And then over time, you improve your asteroid shape estimates using this EKF, which improves your OPNAV, and then creates an algorithm which gives you the most accurate estimates possible and allows you to autonomously navigate any asteroid possible. And this opens up a lot of opportunities when it comes to future of asteroid space navigation. Thank you. Up next, we have Sean Malani, a senior in chemical engineering, with his project Hybrid Radiation Mechanism in Heart Park that enables ultra safe semi solid fire retardant electrolyte and lithium ion batteries. Please welcome him to the stage. In our modern efforts to electrify our society, and more specifically our transportation sector, we as researchers, as scientists, and as engineers have been forced to develop and implement new technologies. One of these technologies is lithium ion batteries. In short, batteries in general are electrochemical cells, as you can see in the top left image, which transport metal ions back and forth between electrodes and either reduce or oxidize the ions and store them until an opposite charge is introduced. In, um, but what happens in between? In lithium ion batteries specifically, there is a liquid electrolyte that is highly conductive in transporting these lithium ions back and forth across the membrane from electrode to electrode. But this liquid electrolyte is highly oxidative and highly flammable and poses a real safety hazard when a leak could occur or it could vaporize and come in, into contact with an ignition source. This is the leading cause for electric car fires that we see too often on the news. What our group has developed is a phosphate-based electrolyte that has the electrochemical ability to form phosphoryl radicals, as you can see in the bottom image, and these phosphoryl radicals prevent this rapid oxidation of the, of the liquid electrolyte and also have an ability to be implemented into a solid electrolyte, which adds another level of safety to the overall battery cell design. Yet, when we implemented this phosphate electrolyte into a lithium ion battery that uses conventional graphite electrodes, we were able to see that there was this co-intercalation mechanism 
which means that these phosphoryl radicals are working their way into these graphite layers with the lithium ions and exfoliating or pushing apart these graphite layers. And this damages the ideal lithiation or insertion of lithium ions into the anode material. We found that we could use hard carbon, which is a completely amorphous or disordered carbon, instead and this was able to greatly improve the functionality of our batteries. We further took this to study the mechanism and found that while there was still some intercalation, there was also a surface absorption step where the lithium was able to deposit onto the cells. This was able to be studied and we were able to prove that we could work with this flame retarding electrolyte and make a safer battery. Thank you. Next up, we have Amelia Pinnell, a senior in applied physics with her project Dark Matter Direct Detection, Next Steps in Probing the Dark Universe. Please welcome her to the stage. Thank you so much. All right, so for centuries, astronomers have been looking up, sorry, not centuries, about a century, astronomers have been looking up into the night sky. They've noticed that things don't proceed roughly as we'd expect them to, given our current knowledge of physics. And things might move faster than we expect them to, or things might move differently in general. Um, we attribute this to a substance that adds mass to the universe, that permeates the entirety of our reality called dark matter. It's a very mysterious substance. We don't know much about it. But the things we do know is that it makes up about five times as much of the universe as our regular matter that makes up our body. And it also um, probably moves relatively slowly. The most important thing we know about it, though, is that it interacts with gravity. And it's invisible, so it doesn't interact with light. There's lots of different postulated particles that might make up dark matter. And one of the most promising is called a WIMP, a weakly interactive massive particle. These particles not only interact with gravity, but they also interact with another force, fundamental force in the universe called the weak force. How are we trying to detect WIMPs? This is where the Xenon collaboration comes in. The Xenon collaboration hosts a series of experiments in Grand Sasso National Laboratory. There's a picture of one of them in Italy. And um, these are very large scale experiments. And I like to describe them as like a bucket of liquid xenon, which is atomic number 54, um, that sits and waits for a particle to come and interact with the liquid xenon. It scintillates light, so it produces light. And we detect that light, and that tells us what type of interaction happened. Hopefully, that interaction is with dark matter. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten that interaction yet. In fact, none of the dozens of experiments that have been proposed or designed to detect dark matter have found that signal. So our goal, and in Dr. Raphael Legg's lab, we have a mini xenon TPC, and our goal is to increase the sensitivity, um, push those lines down, increase the sensitivity of these detectors. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of noise, so we have to eliminate that. And since we haven't gotten a detection yet, 
um, scientists are starting to push into other forms of dark matter drug detection. Um, one of those forms might be the most obvious. Can we detect the, inter the gravitational interactions of dark matter with regular matter? This is where the wind chime project comes in. In Dr. Lang's lab, we have a prototype wind chime experiment, which is essentially an array of coupled, coupled accelerometers that are looking for a dark matter wind, so to speak, as it moves back and forth through the array of accelerometers and interacts gravitationally. So, dark matter is a very frustrating but fascinating problem in modern physics that still hasn't quite been solved yet. Um, once we do figure out what it is, it would be revolutionary to science. We might be able to use it to our advantage. It would revolutionize our understanding of particle physics. And the only things we need to do that are hopefully upgrades and better technology to improve our sensitivity to the particle. Thank you. Next up, we have Evan Colbert, a junior in animal sciences, with this project designing, implementing, and evaluating sex trafficking and domestic violence training program for licensed and law professionals in India. Please welcome him to the stage. During our lifetime, 30% or nearly one in three women will be a victim of some form of violence. In the United States, cases of intimate partner violence, or IPD, and sex trafficking are on the rise. Globally, sex trafficking is a $150 billion industry. This number totals more than the global revenues of Nike and Starbucks combined. In Indiana alone, nearly 500 reports of suspected trafficking were submitted to the National Trafficking Hotline. How can we possibly intervene in something that's such a global issue? The answer to this solution might lie within our salon professionals. Salon professionals, such as barbers, stylists, and nail technicians, have long served as lay health workers. Lay health workers are non-health professionals that are community-based that can implement health training initiatives. For example, salon professionals have successfully educated clients on the importance of getting cancer screenings every year. Salon professionals are also a community hub, building strong relationships with clients and giving them the ability where clients feel they can share sensitive information. Abusers and traffickers will often bring their victims into salons to have their appearance changed or have grooming practices performed. Because of this, our interdisciplinary team full of psychologists, computer and information technologists, public health, and even an animal science kid like me wants to look at the knowledge and institutional gaps that exist at this intersection. Through a mixed methods approach, we surveyed and interviewed salon professionals throughout the state of Indiana. Out of the 405 surveyed professionals, 80% of them believe that they have had a client that's a victim of violence. 45% of them were explicitly told by a client that they were a victim. 
Despite these staggering numbers, Indiana is one of many states that does not implement a violence-based training for salon professionals. It was unanimous across those that we interviewed, and over 80% of those surveyed indicated that there is a need for a comprehensive training. And that leads us to where our work as a team is today. We're developing that collaborative and comprehensive training for salon professionals here in Indiana. The training is going to be reviewed by a community advisory board filled with subject matter experts, including law and policymakers, law enforcement officers, social workers, and salon professionals. This six-module training will be rolled out to a target group of salon professionals in Indiana this summer. They'll have the opportunity to learn how to identify IPD and sex trafficking in their clients, as well as implement their own intervention strategy with the knowledge of what resources and supports are available for them, as well as victims. We as a team are committed to rigorously evaluating this valuable intervention tool in the hopes that this tool will go outside the four walls of a salon and can take the next giant leap towards tackling such a global issue. Thank you. All righty, next up we have Riti Gupta. She's from College of Science and she's going to talk, talk about impact of generative AI on education and research. Let's welcome her to the stage. Okay, so imagine a classroom where every textbook can write itself based on and is personalized for every student based on their learning styles, the pace in which they learn, and just, just making learning easier for them. Now, envision a research project in which AI does all the data analysis for you, and the researcher can delve deeper into the actual exploration and discovery. Now I bring a truth in front of you. Everything that I've said until now was actually written by AI. This just shows that AI is so intricately related to our lives that it is very essential to understand its impact on us. This is why I am researching on the topic, impact of generative AI on education and research. So what we're researching about is, firstly, language specific variations. We will have one single AI detector and one single piece of content translated in two different languages. So it, when we put the English article into the AI detector, we see that it is 62% AI written. However, when its Spanish translation is checked, it is actually 100% human written. So we want to uh, test this disparity through our research. Secondly, we will assess AI detector performance. So we will compare two AI detectors with each other for instance, we will put GPT-0 and produce Turnitin detector against each other and see if they uh, produce disparities in their outcomes. Then we will also assess implications for teaching and learning. 
in the sense that maybe a student is actually good at writing. However, he is flagged for AI for use of generative AI. In this situation, it is important to think whether AI. Uh, it is important to think whether uh, AI can actually tell and mimic uh, humans' crea humans' creativity and uh, originality. That is why it is important to know what implications AI can have on teaching and learning. Lastly, we will also find the impact on research. So, while it can be a fool for teachers, for researchers, it can be quite a companion. Researchers can do give all the boring work to AI and actually do all the cool stuff for themselves. So, my project is all about bringing brains and bites together, and it's, it's a wild ride into the heart of generative AI. Thank you. And, um, also, my conclusion was also written by AI. Next up, next up, we have Abigail Hackelman. She is a first year engineering student, and her topic today is AI supported personal ultrasound to improve maternal outcomes. Let's welcome her to the stage. Thank you. From 1990 to 2019, the United States reported a nearly three fold increase in maternal mortality rates. To put this in perspective, that means it's just one of two countries to report a significant increase over that 30-year period. Then, the rates continued to increase from 23.8 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births in 2020 to 32.9 in 2021. Again, to put this in perspective, that's a maternal mortality rate nearly thrice as high as Canada's. Pregnancy-related deaths are a nuanced issue with many contributing factors, but access to proper maternal care, I believe, is one of the most notable. In my research, I'm evaluating the feasibility of AI-supported maternal ultrasound technology, and I present my findings in a viewpoint article. Among the world of maternal care, handheld alter among the world of maternal care, <laughs> ultrasound technology is one of a scarce resource that is often not afforded to patients. Um, this is because the devices are very expensive, and the standard of care for 70 years has been office-based ultrasounds that take place in person. For many patients, geographical and or financial barriers get in the way, and they're not able to access these treatments. Several companies have come up with handheld devices that attempt to negate the need for students to go in person, or for patients to go in. <laughs> Several companies have developed handheld ultrasound devices that no longer requires patients to go in person to a hospital to receive care. These devices are often cheaper and can be 
performed virtually anywhere. Point of care ultrasonography, also known as POCUS in the diagram, is the practice of using these devices to transmit the data to a healthcare professional, either virtually in like, real time or later on um, by storing the images. However, this doesn't completely fix the problem because there still needs to be highly trained sonographers that are present to conduct these scans. So, we hypothesize that applying AI to these devices can once again try to mitigate some of these barriers. AI can work in two ways. First, it can be a digital assistant so that patients themselves and or low trained community health workers can conduct the scans without needing a trained sonographer on site. Second, the AI can help doctors can help the community health workers who are often not specialized and not as knowledgeable about this as doctors decide if and when a patient needs to see a, go to a hospital to see someone in person. This is a great way, I believe, to make maternal care more accessible, but obviously with any new technology, a thoughtful implementation and considering the existing systems like the doctors that currently practice this medicine and the hospitals that make so much money off of it will be important to ensuring a meaningful outcome. Next up, we have Abigail. I'm sorry. Next up, we have Virtual Paul. She is a sophomore in biomedical health sciences, and her topic today is about the jitters. It might be PSAF induced hyperactivity. Let's welcome her to the stage. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today. By a quick show of hands, how many of you guys have eaten or drank anything in the past day? Okay, a lot of hands. How about the past week? Plain hands. Well, you're all sitting in front of me happy and healthy, so I think you guys have been doing this for quite a while now. Well, I hate to break this to you, but you've all been chronically exposed to PFAS. Well, what are PFAS? PFAS are a group of persistent organic pollutants that have surfactant properties, which means that they're found in things such as your non-stick cookware, your food uh, containers, and also your waters, water systems. So PFAS are a giant group of chemicals that basically affect all of your organ systems because they love to attach onto your little fat organs. Um, but in our lab, we focus mainly on the effect of PFAS in the brain. The specific PFAS chemical that we look at is called PFOS, and it's been associated with um, different neuro disorders such as Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and um, major depressive disorder. So we hypothesized that chronic PFOS exposure via the water route, such as we're all being exposed to right now, um, will result in motor behavior dysfunction in the mouse model. So how do we do this? Well, we took one-year-old mice, we exposed them to PFAS through the water route or the other control group was just regular drinking water. And then after 16 months, which is the chronic part of the expo uh, exposure, 
we tested out their motor behavior by basically making them walk across um, a challenging beam, which is a beam of chicken wire that narrows as the mouse walks on it. We counted the amount of errors the mouse made by seeing how many times its foot slipped through the wire and how many steps it took and how long it took to cross the beam. What we found is that the specific region of the brain that we were focusing on actually showed improved um, function, which was contrary to our hypothesis. But we also learned that it took decreased steps to walk across the beam in P-plus-treated females and decreased amount of time to walk across the beam in the P-plus-treated males. Well, that actually just shows that there were hyperactivity symptoms in the P-plus-treated um, males and females. So the next time that you've got the shakes, your legs twitching a little too hard, or you just can't seem to get your thoughts in order, I implore you to think, was it the cup of coffee you had earlier, or was it just the PFAS portion of your brains? Thank you. Alrighty, next up we have Juniper Rodriguez. He is a senior in anthropology and his topic today is exploring collective adaptation through evolving partisan networks of political discourse. Let's give him a round of applause. So in today's world, online discourse can greatly impact our beliefs and influence real world events. Thus, it is more important than ever to understand how these online narratives form, considering how they shape public opinion and influence policy. And using the collective adaptation framework, 
we can investigate how the problems that we face, the social environment that we inhabit, and the strategies that we use to interact with one another all come together. So when we're in online political spaces, we react to media that represents current issues, such as elections, protests, and pandemics. And as a computational social scientist, I get an overview of this discourse by using methods from natural language processing to compress this data into topics. And by studying how people talk about these topics across different websites over time, we can see how they adapt to these issues. And to represent the dynamics of this discourse computationally, we created networks from topics by finding which words appear together the most relative to the rest of the data set. In our analysis, we focus on key topics such as abortion, vaccines, and climate change. And after creating these localized networks of these topics, we compared them and found some slight differences. For example, this is the um, localized network of abortion in the Hill. And as you can see, there are some nodes related to it that relate to religion, medicine, race, etc. However, this is just a small sliver of what's going on inside the network. So me and my team decided to instead look at this from a more macro scale. So instead of just having select nodes in the network, we decided to look at all topics and see how they relate to one another. And after running a Lovain community detection algorithm on it, we found that some themes within this network arose, such as internet communication, US politics, and Seth, which stands for science, economy, technology, and health. And we found that more left-leaning and centrist platforms had our topics of interest located within the Seth community. And on more right-leaning platforms, they were located in a community that had to do with more polarizing issues. So currently we are implementing a temporal community detection algorithm uh, to see how these communities evolve over time. And then we'll conduct analyses to examine the relationship between current events and network events to see where the community splits, merges, grows, et cetera. So by utilizing this methodology, we can examine how these political communities online adapt in response to real world events. And we can use these findings to create computational models of discourse and develop ways to reduce political division and hostility. After Hannah provides their presentation, if you did, if you got a audience favorite, but you did not use your QID to scan, uh, if you came in later, or you didn't do it earlier, you can please come and scan your QID uh, after Hannah's presentation, uh, and then before I take the judges away from the break, so just have that ready. So right after Hannah, pop, 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 come down, scan your QID, and that's just so that we keep track of how many people are here today. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we have Hannah Valenza. She's a junior in finance. And her topic today is the impact of climate change on taxes. Let's welcome her to the stage. You are a citizen of Texas. And today, instead of exploring your local farmer's market, 
You're indoors, desperately trying to avoid being one of the nearly 300 individuals who will die of heat exhaustion this summer. My name is Hannah Williamson, and today, through synthesizing several studies, I will be examining the impacts of climate change on Texas's economy. First, we'll be looking at water scarcity, then we'll be pivoting to the agricultural segment of the economy, and finally, we will be examining what businesses are implementing in order to overcome these challenges. Starting with water scarcity, first we must examine the Texas High Plains Aquifer. This aquifer contributes to 20% of the nation's water supply, as well as 90% of Texas's water supply. Due to a 0.3 degree increase in temperature, we are looking at severe degradation of this aquifer. We're drawing out 10 times more groundwater than what can be replaced due to lacking rainfalls, as well as a reduction in the soil moisture retention. So what does this mean for agriculture? Water is what drives agriculture. And 86% of Texas's land is dedicated to the agricultural development of this state. So 86% of the land goes into producing agriculture. What we're seeing with the extreme incline in temperatures is a decrease in consumer demand, a decrease in crop yields, as well as a decrease in cattle yields. For cattle, you need water to both sustain growth as well as sustain biological resources, such as milk or meat or eggs. So what exactly are businesses doing to overcome these gaps? Because from our agriculture, ag agricultural segment, we have lost $7 billion in annual nominal GDP. Extreme temperatures have led to $10 billion of annual nominal GDP lost. Businesses are implementing several ways to overcome these challenges. First, businesses are implementing creative cooling solutions. An example of this is in Arlington, Six Flags has been implementing um, the installation of cabanas to keep consumers out of heat. $600 million have been spent towards these solutions. Next, we have businesses that are shifting their business hours to avoid the highest heats of the day, which helps consumers get out and participate in the market. And finally, farmers are switching their growing seasons as well as going through uh, a simulation of different crop varieties as well as rotating their crops. We can utilize this information to inform our government in order to pass policies to aid these businesses. Thank you very much. While they do that, the each person audience has the chance to vote for their favorite research speech. Please use the paper card that you have received in the beginning. 
when you came, yeah, to make your selection. If you are earning after credit for class, please include your name in the back of the car, on the back of the car and the course number. Does it just become a tribe? Yeah, yeah, Great job, everybody. Fantastic. So, yes, we're going to vote. What kind of audience is there? Anyone else with any more voting cards? We'll take pictures and stuff like that. We should be done a little earlier. Uh, yeah, we can see we can see it. Yeah, I just I yeah, so that's one reason to be taken. So it does one thing, but when you have like a lot of physics, like you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can't say that. Yeah, you can't say that. Yeah, you can't say I dropped the name there, but oh, really? <laughs> yeah. 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 It's really cool. So, like, that's like the thing you can detect, like, how far away we are from the asteroid. Yeah. 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 I kind of wish I had more time, but I guess that would be like me, so I'm sure it's a bit smaller though. But yeah, I think it's just like the next really fun. Yeah, absolutely. Like, the realizing stuff like that is exactly what this is. Yeah, true, yeah. So it's like, I'm shot, I'm going to have to take it out. Are you doing the strength? Yes. I'm doing a poster presentation. Okay, nice. Are you doing the research part? I'm doing, yeah, the research part. Oh, that's lucky. I'm happy I'm doing the research part. I can ask you. Congratulations, Brian. Yeah. 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 The docs are, I think, more selective from what I've heard. And it's, yeah, it's really fun. Um, last year I did it, super exciting. It's a lot longer than this, and you get to go in a lot more depth. So you can really, like, I think your project has a lot of stuff that's been really discussed. So. <laughs> Yeah.
Okay. I really want to see yours. I think it's yours. No, I got it. Okay. Okay. So, all right, everyone. So, while we're waiting for the drivers, if you both want honest favorites, we would like to invite Anaya Albert on stage. Anaya was the winner of last year's Richard Cage competition. She graduated from Purdue with a GSD degree in civil engineering and is currently on her way to get her master's um, in civil engineering. Well, we are thrilled to welcome her back today to update us on what she has been working on. Let's give her a round of applause. Hi, everyone. My name is Anaya, as you just so heard. Um, I was here last year as a senior undergraduate researcher. That was uh, my first year researching, um, and I was really glad to have won the undergraduate research competition as well as audience favorites. So that was a really cool experience, mind blowing. Um, now I'm a master's student. I'm doing my master's thesis in civil engineering materials. Uh, I did my undergrad in structural engineering, and I have recently like just decided that I'm going to go for my PhD right after. So back to back to back. So that's how we're going to do it. Um, uh, yeah, academia is really taking a stronghold on uh, my interests. So I'm just going to go ahead and go through it. Um, currently, I'm working on a few different research projects, along with the one that I started in my undergraduate years. So I'm doing recycled textile fiber research, which is what I presented last year. And then on top of that, I'm also doing a uh, synergistic effects of nanomodified cementitious composites. So in short, that's using really small materials and adding them into cement-based materials to see what happens in combination with CO2 carbon capture um, formation and curing processes. So it's a lot more that I'm also looking forward to, and it's just nice to finally get my feet wet with the whole graduate research thing. I've had the pleasure of being a TA, and I'm currently a GRA, a graduate research assistant. So it's a lot to look forward to. Um, I will say that, of course, for the undergraduates going forward, uh, and I'm pretty sure since you're doing research now, you probably have a passion for it. I, I think we can all say we have a passion for it. And going forward, whether you do academia or whether you do industrial work, make sure that you trailblaze and do the things that you want to do for your career. Don't let anyone else influence what you have going on. Make sure you know exactly what you want to do so that when you get there and things get hard, which they will most definitely get hard, you have that passion there with you. Um, despite the incentive. Of course, as a, last year as an undergraduate research winner, of course I had to relinquish my money and give it back to them because I had scholarships already, but I was still extremely glad to have that opportunity because I enjoyed the research. So make sure your heart is in the same place, no matter what you do, and you're going to be great. So I'm just excited to see you know how this turns out. I hope you all had a great time, and I hope you all continue research in the future. It's really nice to see what's going on. Thank you.
Thank you, Anaya. We're, we will now come around to collect your audience favorite card. Never mind. While we wait for the judges to finish, I would like to know a few upcoming Alabama research events. So, um, the Spring Underground Research Conference will be on April 9th to 16th and include posters, research talks, and virtual presentations. The celebrant produced thinker, creators, and experimenter showcase will be on April 18th. This event puts aside the posters and research talks and gets the audience engaged with research by having items that are better interacted with or displayed. The African American Studies and Research Center Undergraduate Summer Research Internship is also currently accepting applications for this summer. Earn up to $6,000 to cover your experience as you work with staff professionals. To explore, process, and organize spending collections detailing all facets fa fa of Black life and history. Check out the OER website for details on how to apply. The 2024 to 2025 $1,000 OER scholarship program is also, is also accepting Purdue applications. The initial round of Purdue student applications are due March 31st, so the deadlines are coming up and projects are continuously being added to the application website. Check out the OUR website for eligibility and expectations. Thank you. Yes, now I'm just audience. It was so much better. I hope I didn't mess it all because I felt like I did. I still don't remember. Is there faucets? Basics? Facets? Facets? I would say, but it doesn't matter. Okay, sorry. I must pronounce like three names after asking them how to Yeah, and it's a little awkward. I was saying, like, I read it wrong. Like, when we go to commercial, I said Abigail, and I realized, no, it's Herschel. So, yeah. Okay. I don't think anyone minds. Okay. Thank you. Thank you guys for your tolerance. That's a good You're doing great. Don't forget this is live Oh, they can't hear us? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> How many people are there? Five. <laughs> just poked my head on the camera. <laughs> it's okay. Five people. It's all right. We're just talking. Yeah. Thank you for coming. We're still waiting for the results to show up. Please be more patient. Yeah. But to be honest, I feel like some of the projects are really similar. I guess they're like, for example, they talk about like the access and that's like something we talk about in, uh, in pharmacy school a lot about, about the access to 
health, through like the social determinants of health, so like well, how they get them. Like some patients cannot get the transportation to the health clinics, or they don't have food resources. So without like a good nutrition, their health of course is like declining. Yeah. So I can resonate with some of the topics. Are you part of the farm B program? Yeah, so I'm very old. <laughs> yeah, I have one more year to graduate. And then next year, I will not be on campus. I'll be just doing the vacations around. Are you thinking of pharmacy program? Uh, my roommate is. Oh, what year is she? First year. First year? Okay. Yeah, is she in any of like program, learning community, or? Um, she's from pharmaceutical science. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We do have two sub majors under the College of Pharmacy. There's a Farm B track and there's a BSPS, which is the Sam is doing a BSPS. I'm doing fine. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I know. It's a lot. Yeah. 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 The five people that listen to us. I would just love to hear you present. Yeah. Well, yeah, I want to do it from your research. I did. Actually, it's a little bit of like this summer research how we're getting it. I think it was like one of the first shootings we did. Oh, when you did it, though. Yeah, okay. I I remember it. Yeah, so you should have done it like at the like at the what is your research about again? I that that's my problem. I don't know who they are. Wait, you're doing a I Yeah, I also did a summary. Mine was different. Mine was on geriatric at this point, the so the group that I was chatting most of the back in April, so I'll go to that for the rest of the year, I guess. And then next next semester, I'm, I have some that I'm already. I'm gonna like get the email prepared like over the summer, and then right when school so just. Yeah, look at how it's all. What are you doing? What is your next step? Like human development. I I have one. She's a new cop, so she's gonna be a new cop. Um, 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 my animal science class, the one professor, um, he is now at the Arkansas, and the other one is on the retirement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Wait, so that's I know one person. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And then after that, I will be in India doing nuclear policy. Yeah. I know our friends are asking me, but I want to say it's a different company. Yeah, it's totally different because uh, you can choose different sites, but then like it depends on their availability and other availability. Like we're making sacrifices and compromises to make sure we have each have a schedule that works out. Um, I have, I'll have two locations in hospitals, one location in community, and then there's one in the loose area, which is like ambulatory care, which is like clinics. Um, and then I have three locations on English, one location in the loose and then one in the loose But ten rotations is like a whole year. So we don't have break except winter break. That's crazy. So after like literally the last summer was my last summer in school. Because after this I'll be working. So like yeah, I'm about to work. So old. Yeah, so the reason. Oh, that's so cool. But you have a little break, I guess. Are you thinking about going anywhere? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Y